see you so with Veridin. Uh, let's just go quickly around and introduce everybody. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, before we start, who recognizes these guys? Yes, ma'am. Bonnie and Clyde, right? So what made Bonnie and Clyde so successful in the late 20s, early 30s as bank robbers? Two, two things. One was the interstate highway system, and two was really fast cars with V8 engines. And at the time, if you were able to rob a bank in Arkansas, but cross the border into, let's say, Texas, you were home free. The police couldn't, couldn't follow you. And the FBI was, what, I think 10, 5, 10 years old at that point. So Hoover came along and said, hey, maybe we should make bank robbery a federal offense. So he said, maybe we got to think about this stuff differently because this is starting to really suck and these guys are becoming heroes. And we all kind of know how it ended after they did that. Not only could they follow them across straight lines, but they died pretty tragically. Uh, but the reason I put them up there is the FBI at the time had to think differently about something that we, we take for granted today. Of course, bank robbery should be a, a federal offense, duh. But back then it wasn't so obvious. And all of us are in some way, shape, or form working in cybersecurity, either on the academic side or studying it or in business. Um, and I think we've based a lot of what we do on what we did. And just because it's the way we did it doesn't mean it's the way we should continue doing it. And I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm certainly learning a lot every day. Um, when I try to find videos that I think are emblematic of our industry, I always try to show them in, in venues like this. And I think I found one that was pretty cool. I was on Reddit, and I saw this. I have no idea where this is or what this is. But I think it really kind of encompasses what our industry is. And if you think of these guys with the white shirts and, I guess, white helmets as the defenders and the guys running at them as the attackers, I think it kind of shows what we do day in, day out. It's only about a minute. And that just about sums it up, right? <laughs> I don't know who you have to piss off to be the guy in the top of the poll, but it looks like it really sucks. Um, so a little background on me. I've been doing this for about 20 years. I started my career with DISA, the Defense Information uh, Substance Agency down in Fort Huachuca. Um, worked for Bell Labs a little bit in Brazil. But then I just started building security startups. Um, companies like Riptech. I was like employee five at ArcSight, built in Perva. Solera Networks, took McAfee through the Intel acquisition. I've written a couple books. I wrote my last book with the director of the NSA. I've done a lot of work on the intelligence side as well. Um, so I've been doing, doing this for a while with a lot of different companies and learning a lot. I've worked in about 50 countries, and as you can tell, they're all very high in carbohydrates. Um, but I'm wearing this pocket square, and I read that it's supposed to make you look thinner, but I caught a glimpse of myself in the glass, and I think mine's broken. So if you guys <laughs> know of a good pocket square repair place, I'll definitely swing by. Um, what I've got for you, I think, is a pretty cool presentation. I've spoken at a, a bunch of B-sides um, uh, over probably like the last six or seven months. Uh, this is actually my first B-sides in Nashville, so again, very excited to be here. Um, it's about killing this idea of assumptions, assumption-based security, that we assume our products are working the way we want. We assume our security is providing the, the capabilities we need. And then also addressing environmental drift, the idea that something that was working continues to work over time, and because of day-to-day -day activity, change in a tap, a span port, a patch, a signature, a rule, something that was working has stopped. You know, I invested millions and millions of dollars in a security control that was logging to my SIM, but then somebody in infrastructure installed the proxy, which is now blocking syslog. Now I have no idea why I'm not getting my information anymore, and attacks are going pie, and I'm not getting them. So that's what I mean by environmental drift. I'm going to show you several demonstrations today of kind of how you can hack your own network in order to validate and do security instrumentation. I'm not here to pitch you a product. I'm not here to talk about the Veridin way, but I am here to talk about security instrumentation kind of as an idea and how you can approach it. We're not the only company who does it, but I want to talk to you a little bit about how it can be done. So, boy, that's going to be hard for everybody to see. Good thing I'm not going line by line. Uh, if, we, if we look at technology, 
and kind of how it's evolved over the years from cave paintings to computer systems and radios and telephones and everything like that. We live in a pretty innovative time. Who would agree that we probably live in one of the most innovative times in history when it comes to technology? I would, I would agree. Maybe not as fast as Wakanda, but um, I think we're, we're, we're pretty damn innovative. Um, now, I was told that if Greece hadn't been sacked by Rome, that by 1492 they would have had a manned expedition to Mars. But my dad told me that, and he's from Greece, so consider the source um, on that one. But what I think is really interesting is it's, it's not a linear progression, right? We have these quantum leaps that we take occasionally in security. And one of them, if we look at Joseph Jacquard, he was the inventor of the automatic loom. Essentially, he was the world's first mechanical computer. And it was definitely the predecessor to computer punch tape and computer punch cards. Actually, IBM took the design from that and used it for their first mechanized uh, computer punch card design in 1899. But what was neat about this is they developed this computing system that could help make textiles, specifically blankets. And they went from making about 10 a day in this factory of workers to making over 100 a day because it had these memory cards, so input, output, it was, you know, it was a computer. Well, the employees got a little bit scared. They're like, look, they can just buy a bunch of these machines, and eventually they're going to replace us with them. So they, one night, they all gathered together, they broke into this factory, and they just smashed this machine to pieces. I always think it's very ironic that the world's first computer suffered an insider threat, right? But then you see things, you know, we had ARPANET in 69, and then TCP IP, and you know, web browsers and Google, and then the epitome of our civilization is Netflix's skip intro button, which that person was a genius that came up with that if you're trying to binge watch anything. But we make assumptions all the time that this technology is going to work, it's going to be safe and secure, that's going to do what we want. If we put a key in the car, we expect it to turn on. If we, you know, turn our phone on, we expect it to work. Though I know one of my colleagues today, his phone wasn't working today on the campus, and it was made life very difficult for us. What's this look like? Looks like an ant, right? This actually isn't an ant. It's a spider. It's an ant mimicking spider. Even nature makes assumptions. So this guy takes its uh, front two legs and holds them up in the air and says, hey, look, these are just antennae. And he goes walking around in an ant colony, and all the ants go, hey, what's up, other ant? Because they assume he's an ant. Well, he's not an ant, but he likes to eat ants, so he looks like an ant. So that's the ant mimicking spider. So it's not just humans. We see it in nature as well. Assumptions are always made. So the problem is, when you start making assumptions in cybersecurity, it starts to really suck, and things start to break down. And you start spending millions and millions of dollars on security. I was working with a major financial in the UK. They have over 350 security vendors, not products, but disparate vendors within their organization. That's the extreme side. But I see companies all the time with 50, 60, 70 different security vendors. And they're basing their security on these assumptions that everything's working the way they want without actually validating. So here are some of the issues that we see. We assume technology works as the vendors describe. There's a lot of good vendors out there. There's probably some bad vendors. 1,300 security vendors got Series A funding just last year. 1,300. That's probably about 1,000 too many. Right? Some of them are great. In most cases, they're doing something new, not something different. Like, so I'm on the board of Silence, for example. So Silence does endpoint in a new way. I did ArcSight, which was a sim. ArcSight did it in a new way. You know, Imperva, it did WAF in a new way. But it's been a long time since we had something that was actually different, a different category of security, like instrumentation, that actually says, hey, let's not just do something new. Let's actually do something different. Let's turn it on its ear. The other thing we see is we assume products are deployed and configured correctly. Maybe the vendor is the absolute best product in the world. But look at products that are really great, like Palo Alto Firewall. I think it's a great firewall. Highly customizable, highly configurable, though. You know, IDS, IPS, like Sourcefire, Snort, very configurable. Silence, very configurable. It's very easy to make a mistake, especially if you don't have a way to validate that what I just did actually does what I want and doesn't break something else in my track. It's very hard to do. And it's not just tech, it's people and process as well. I want to make sure my people are well-trained and well-practiced, so when something bad does occur, that they know what to do and the processes they follow actually work. And I don't want to do it by doing like a little war game once a year where we sit around a white table, a whiteboard, and kind of write up who we'll call and what we'll do. That didn't work 20 years ago. It certainly doesn't work today. And then finally, my favorite is about environmental drift. We assume because we've got things working and it's really just swimming along, great, that it's just going to continue to do that. And it's never the case. 
A lot of you probably work on red teams and do pen tests and security assessments, and you know as well as I do. By the time the last line of that report's printed out, the network has changed, things have changed, vulnerabilities have changed, and the whole process starts again. And, I, and I've done this, you know, where you've gone into an organization, you do a pen test, you come back the next year, you do it again, it's the exact same thing. All you need to do is change the date because people haven't got around to fixing it. So there's this massive gap between red team and blue team, offensive and defensive, right? That's a problem. So at the core of this is the fact that we're spending a ton of money, putting a lot of time and resources, and security is not being effective. So my idea is this. There's this notion out there called security instrumentation. <clears throat> Probably a lot of you haven't heard of this, but quick raise, raise of hands. Who's heard the term security instrumentation before? OK, a couple of you. It's great. Um, a good analogy for it, it's probably not a good analogy, but an analogy for it. Um, if you think about automated manufacturing, right? I kind of like the Joseph Jacquard thing we talked about with textiles. You know, we, you know, Henry Ford was great at this idea. He said, let's go ahead and build an assembly line. We'll go faster, better, cheaper, higher quality, this, that, and the other thing. We'll instrument it. We'll tune it. We'll improve it. Well, and then fast forward to like something like HP OpenView. Has anybody in here ever used HP OpenView or is familiar with it? A couple of you? You know, if you've got a, a router in Nashville and a router in San Francisco and the link is green, it's up. If it's red, it's down. If it's yellow, it's flapping something in between, essentially. In security, we don't have anything like that. I mean, I can tell you Palo or Silence or Imperva or Arc, ArcSight or all these products are up and running. I can't tell you if they're doing what they're supposed to do. I could just as easily tell you a hairdryer is running. I don't know if Palo is blocking that attack. If it is, is it reporting it to the SIM? If it is, is the SIM correlating it? I have no idea. I have no way to do that. So that's what instrumentation tries to address. So again, I'm not going to necessarily talk about how we do that at Veridin, but I want to talk about it as a concept. So consider this. Consider a very simple model where you have a management console, or we'll call it a director. Right? This director is going to have integration with your back-end defensive stack. Things like your SIMs, your log management, your Palo Alto panoramas, your checkpoint firewall managers, your silence managers, McAfee EPO, wherever you do security aggregation, log management, et cetera. Okay? And we'll get back to why that's important later. And then consider these things called actors or sensors that are employed throughout your environment in strategic locations. Let's, let's look at how that works. So here's a very simple environment. Everybody here probably has a much more complex one, even if it's your home lab. But you've got an internet connection, you've got a DMZ, critical servers, desktops, et cetera, et cetera. Throughout these environments, you also have a ton of security controls, right? Whether it's Palo or McAfee or Cisco or whatever you happen to have, they're sitting in this network. So you take these sensors, and these are self-contained sensors. Typically, the way instrumentation companies work is they'll deploy these as virtual machines. Now, they can be hardware. It can be like an Intel Nook. I haven't seen people do it on a Raspberry Pi. I wouldn't suggest that for production. Um, they can live in a cloud like an Amazon or Microsoft. But they're just little self-contained sensors. They're not living on your Oracle database, your Apache web server, your router, your firewall, anything like that. They're just by themselves in these disparate network zones. Big companies sometimes have about 100 of these. Medium-sized companies still, you know, maybe they have a few dozen of these. You usually don't see people running thousands and thousands of different actors. This is where it starts to get really interesting. These actors act as both attacker and target. And this changes the entire paradigm that I was talking about. This is why it's different. This is why it's not the same old stuff we've been doing for 20 years. The actors only attack each other. And in doing so, they're validating the efficacy of the security controls for which they're passing through. Hey. Attacker, actor A attacks actor B. Did it get blocked or not? If it did get blocked, did it at least create an event? If it created an event, did it go to the firewall manager? If that did, did it go to the SIM? If it got to the SIM, did it get correlated? Which goes back to my talk before about the API integration with your backend defensive stack. Very simple concept, very different. Actors deploy to attack each other in order to validate your security controls. I'm not attacking your databases, your web servers, your desktops attacking myself, which means I have zero false positives, which is great. Because when you go back and say, hey, this firewall didn't block it, it's not some kind of qualitative, squishy ROSI calculation. It's real empirical data. It didn't get through. And if it's a really good instrumentation solution, it will further take the step to say, hey, by the way, if you didn't block it, or you didn't detect it, or you didn't correlate it, this is what you need to add. Then you go ahead and add it. You rerun the test to make sure when you added it, you didn't stick a space where there should have been a tab or a colon where there should have been a semicolon and say, OK, now it's actually working. And now I want you to test this once a day with a 1,000 other tests every single day in perpetuity. That changes the game, because now we're validating security controls. We're not simply scanning for vulnerabilities and seeing if we can exploit a hole on something because somebody hasn't patched it. That's still important. 
Red teaming, security assessments, pen tests, still absolutely critical. This augments it, but it also gives you a completely different angle. And because of that, it's valuable not just for red teaming, but for blue teaming. And as you can probably extrapolate from this, it's equally valuable for not just CISOs and CIOs, but also CEOs and even the board, which has always been a gap for security. You know, we're in a situation where for decades we've been saying, hey, we want a voice. Security wants a voice with the executive team. We want a voice with the board. Then, oh, then crap, now it's happening. Now they're saying, okay, that's great. You guys have a voice now. You better be able to measure security like we measure other strategic business units like sales and operations. Don't come to me and tell me you need $2 million for DLP because we need to protect our data and it's important and everybody else is doing it. Come back with empiric evidence. Tell me how much it's going to cost. And then I can say, is this a $2 million problem or is it not? And if it's not, you move on to the next thing. That's how we need to be communicating at those levels. And every security team across the world is starting to do this. And we're starting to see a fundamental change. Generally speaking, in a lot of organizations, the CISO reports to the CIO. I'm seeing that flipping now. In fact, a major pharmaceutical just last week that I work with, now the CIO reports to the CISO. And a lot of reasons that, that that's happening is this. Because of decentralization, consumerization of IT, cloud, etc., CIOs don't have the umbrella effect that they used to. Business units are operating more autonomously so they can be more agile. Well, what's the umbrella then? Then the umbrella becomes a risk. The umbrella becomes security. So now it's starting to flip-flop. In this particular pharmaceutical, the CIO promoted himself to CISO and hired a CIO under him. Right? And I'm starting actually to see this uh, in a couple other organizations as well. Very interesting change. Um, but let me pause there just for a second because this architecture is something new. And I'm going to actually show you this in action. It's one thing to talk about. It's another thing just to show it to you. Um, but any questions at all on the architecture of how instrumentation works? Okay, cool. Um, I like to break things up with jokes and fun facts because you'll hear me drone on about security and your brain needs a, a break. So, sharks are actually older than trees. No relevance at all to what I'm talking about. I just thought I'd, I'd share that. Sharks are actually 400 million years old and trees are only 350 million years old. So I learned that on Reddit. Does anybody here go on Reddit? That's a today I learned on Reddit. I actually learned it a few weeks ago, but I thought it was pretty freaking awesome. They've also survived like four extinction events, so it's pretty cool. So anyway, sharks are older than trees. Okay, now your brain's had a break. So what are some of the usage scenarios for security instrumentation? Well, the first thing is just I want to validate that my stuff's working. And I'm not going to go through all these. I'll probably hit the top five. I want to be able to validate that my firewall, my IPS, my endpoint, my WAF, all these tools are actually doing what I'm expecting them to do. Well, duh. Of course we want to be able to do that. But we've never had a, a platform to do it. We've always tried to kind of do it with assessments and audits and reviewing stuff, but it's never empiric. It's always very qualitative. Second thing is I want to be able to prescriptively tune that. That's still on point one. But I want to be able to say, no, I haven't just found a hole, but this is how I can fix the hole. Which brings us to point two. When I make configuration changes, I want to actually be able to validate that that change is doing what it's supposed to do and it doesn't have a negative impact someplace else. Or when somebody else in my environment makes a change, reorders firewall rules, changes a tap or a span, installs a proxy, that it doesn't break something that was working. We see all the time million dollar infrastructures brought down by five dollar configuration errors. That's the norm, right? Uh, number three, I want to be able to manage by exception. I don't want somebody to have to farm this stuff all day long. I don't want to have a team of, of engineers focused on an instrumentation tool. I want it to all happen in the background. And if anything ever moves from that green state, that known good, to a not good state, then I want to be alerted so I can manage by exception. I don't need to be dedicated to this. Uh, with the cloud as well, a big thing that we see in clouds today is the fact that cloud's flat. It's very hard in a data center to stick your database on the wrong side of the firewall. It's very easy to do that in the cloud. And a lot of the breaches you see today are just because of that. So if you want to measure paths and segmentation and things like that, having those actors and sensors follow that pathway to make sure it continues to operate that way is actually a really big deal. It's a simple deal, but it's a really big deal. And then I want to retire unnecessary stuff. Probably one of the biggest value adds we see from CFOs, say security people never take anything out. It just builds and builds and builds and builds. It's like a basement full of junk. You got some Christmas decorations and some Easter eggs from the 1980s and a Stretch Armstrong that dried out. It's ridiculous. We don't get rid of anything. Well, with this, you can actually validate, hey, these tools are working. These tools aren't. These tools I can't even tune to get to what I need. 
these are completely redundant. Well, get rid of all that garbage then. And then take that revenue that you're gaining from not having to pay support and maintenance and everything else and use that to buy the tools and hire the people that you need. That's a huge one. In fact, the CISO for Blackstone did a video on our website just about that. You know, again, I'm not talking about our company, but he's like, you know, Brian, great. I love instrumentation, but all these other points are great. The big value add that I had is I went in and I said, hey, we can rip out over $5 million worth of product we don't need and use that to buy $5 million worth of product we really do need. Right? So pretty cool stuff. Also, because these actors are instrumented so they only attack each other, it's very safe. I work with a lot of power and energy and oil and gas companies, people like the New York Stock Exchange, British Petroleum, etc. These actors, when they attack each other, first off, they don't just speak TCP IP. They can also speak Modbus and DMP3, which makes them applicable to SCADA environments with PLCs and other industrial control OT environments, right? Because they're not attacking your programmable logical controllers or your turbines that are all running on Windows NT 4.0 and haven't been patched for 15 years because it's been end of life. They're actually operating in a way that allows you to measure the efficacy of the security controls protecting all of those devices, right? Which is really cool. So quick show of hands. How much of your security is managed by assumption? I'll give you just a second to think about that. Okay, who thinks all of their security is managed by assumption? Okay, a few truth tellers. Who thinks part? Okay, none? No nuns? And who just doesn't know? Okay, let me show you the statistics that we got from a survey we recently ran. 2% of these people are horrible liars. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it's going to be part. I don't, I don't think we're in a world today where I could expect everything to be run based on assumptions, or at least you're, you have a pretty good idea that what you're doing is actually working. Maybe it's been proven out through some other mechanism. But by and large, people are managing based on assumption. That's what we see, at least, in at least part, if not all, of their environments. OK, let's go ahead and show this to you, because looking at this is one thing, but the actual attacks are actually pretty cool. Um, is it going to screw up the videos if we close the, shut the lights down? Is that? OK, why don't we try? Because it's just a little small, and I, 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 it just maybe makes it easier for people to see. OK, let's try it out. How's that? Is that a little bit better for you guys? So what, what we're going to do here is we're going to execute a couple different attacks between actors and just see how our security controls respond. Pretty, pretty basic idea. And what, what I want to do here is I made a video of this because the demo gods never, never play nice. Um, I'm going to run a sequence of various attacks using Bartlex and Botrex. So Bartlex, for those of you who don't know, it's a memory resident dropper. It's all sole purpose and license to grab other bad things it can install. So Bartlex is downloaded. It does some C2 beaconing. It grabs Votrack. Votrack's the real bad stuff. Votrack does some C2 beaconing. Starts moving laterally, looking for databases, dumping credentials, turning off local firewalls. And at the end of this attack, we're going to actually exfiltrate data over ICMP. But you could use any protocol, SMTP, HTTP, SSH, et cetera. You can compress it, rip it, rar it, tar it, whatever. Um, the cool thing about this is we're actually not doing this to your databases or your systems. It's going on in your production network, but just between these actors. So it's safe. But according to all your security controls, because these are the absolute honest to goodness real attacks, this is the real stuff. So your palos, your source fires, your impervers, your arc sites, et cetera, your splunks, they should be picking up on this and saying, guys, we got to block this and or alert on this or correlate on this. This is really bad stuff happening. And by the way, most instrumentation solutions will ship with buckets and buckets of attacks. But good ones will also allow you to integrate with threat intelligence feeds like Anomaly, pull in ISAC information, PowerShell stuff, write your own stuff, Python, Ruby. Very extensible. This should be very, very open. So essentially, I said, this is the attack sequence I'm going to run. And then I selected which actors I'm going to run it between. You'll see, or maybe see, assume it's there. There's a little spinning circle up in the top right. That's the director talking to the actors. It's basically telling the actors what their role is. You're Bartolex. You're Votrack. You're going to exfiltrate data. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. They say, great. Now I know what to do. I've got my little Lockheed Martin kill chain on the top right as well. Everything from reconnaissance to action on target. So these are the activities that are emblematic of what a real attack would look like because it is the real attack bits and bytes going across your network on your production controls done safely. My favorite part is this. There's two columns here. They couldn't be simpler. First column is, was this blocked? Yes or no? We know empirically. No false positives. I ran Bartolex. Was Bartolex blocked? Yes or no? Period. The second one is, hey, by the way, regardless of that, did it create an event? 
So I ran this attack. It wasn't blocked, but at least did it get detected. And here we have it reporting to QRadar and Splunk. There's where that API integration to your backend management stack kicks in, right? So it went to QRadar and went to Splunk good. It wasn't blocked, bad. But also bad is it went to QRadar and Splunk, but it didn't show up as a notable event or a correlated event, which means no one's going to see it. Some of our customers get 50,000 events a second. They're not going to see this nonsense. So I go further down and say, OK, what about this one? So now I'm looking at the Vautrack portion of the attack which wasn't blocked, but did create some events. You say, oh, cool. It made it to QRadar, and it made it to Splunk. In the case of QRadar and Splunk for Vautrack, it actually correlated it. It created a notable event. So now I'm saying, OK, now I'm in a situation where not only did I run the attack, and it wasn't blocked, but at least my sim correlated it. So a human is, has a much higher percentage chance of actually looking at this thing. So that's a good thing. Now back to that Bartlex one, if you didn't correlate it, a good SIP will tell you this is what you need to add in to do that. And I'll show you that in another example in just a moment. But that's what we just did there, is we just took some attacks. So think of your boss calls you up. Hey, hey, Brian, I've heard about this thing WannaCry, Apache Struts, Bad Rabbits, whatever, you name it. Are we safe from this? CISOs and security folks get this call all the time. It's very hard to say empirically, yes, we are, no, we're not. Usually, oh, we follow best standards. We've got NIST 853 for our SIM and ISO this and that. But it's hard to say empirically. What if you could say, let me grab the PCAP, let me execute the attack and say, yes, we are here, here, and here, but no, we're not here. And the reason we're not here is because I asked for IPS investment dollars in this network, and you said we couldn't have it because we had to throw a customer bar company barbecue. And now you can say, OK, so now if you'd like me to block it, I need somebody to invest, and maybe we, uh, we don't do the barbecue. And say, OK, now I can make a business decision. But again, it allows security people to talk in empiric ways, instead of just saying we stop bad things from happening. It's really cool. Anyways, show of hands. What solutions do you find most difficult to get value from? And this is one of the ones that I, I think I already know the answer, but it's always neat to see what people say. Um, so we've got firewall, endpoint, IPS, DLP, and SIM slash log management. So who finds firewall the hardest to get value from? OK. Endpoint? IPS? OK. DLP? And, and SIM. Yeah, SIM and DLP are always the, always the bad ones. SIM by far. I think just because people feel like, hey, I just spent a lot of money on SIM. I mean, I've been in deals where, you know, back in the day, I was at ArcSight for seven years. We sold some SIM deals that were upwards of $15, $20 million, right? And if you're only getting 10% value out of that, that really, really hurts, right? But DLP is not far behind. Anybody that runs DLP, I would say 99% of the time, you're just running it in detection mode because you're afraid to block. Remember when ISS first came out with automatic remediation and it would integrate with your checkpoint firewall? And everybody goes, oh, this is the greatest idea ever. So everybody turned it on. When an attack comes, it'll automatically make a firewall rule change. Within 48 hours, we all shut it off because the CIO tried to VPN in and thought it was a DOS attack. And you know, we didn't turn it back on for like 20 years. And that's just how it worked because you got burned, right? So people don't want to turn it on. But what if you could validate it empirically and say, yes, it's going to block this type of thing. Boom, I've tested, I validated it, I trusted it, but I verified it. And now it's working. Now we can actually make forward movement. Security people can actually become more strategic now. OK, I'm going to tell a joke, but I've been told there's only some jokes I'm allowed to tell. So <laughs> why were the Romans so good at algebra? Because x always equals 10. Huh? Get it? All right. I had a better joke, but I was told I wasn't. Anyways. <laughs> so let's talk about snort. I think every, has everybody here worked with Snort pretty much, or at least you know what Snort is? And, okay. Very simple. I'm going to run an attack, and I just want to see if Snort's actually going to detect it and send it to my SIM. That's it. Very simple, very easy. So we have a pretty, pretty basic network here. I'm, I think I've got Security Onion set up for this part of the demo. Oop. And hopefully it moves here. I made a video to avoid any demo problems. And then I get demo problems. Oh, there we go. OK. So we're just going to run a single attack. So we call it actions in Veridin, but it doesn't matter. Whatever instrumentation tool you're running. And there's a whole bunch of attacks to choose from. This one, we're running Angular. 
Angular's been around for a while. It's nothing fancy, nothing cutting edge. It's not like one of the 14 WannaCry variants or something like that. And each one has the CVE, the PCAP, all sorts of different cool stuff about it, which is cool. So I'm just going to pick two actors. And imagine it this way. Imagine that you've got an actor and another actor, and the middle of it is Snort. It can be that easy. And Snort hopefully has some kind of uh, integration with your, with your SIM, whatever your SIM might be. Well, here we see that the attack was not blocked, but furthermore, the attack didn't even create an event, so it wasn't detected. Okay, so that's, that's a problem. We want to fix that because we'd like to detect Angular. So we go into our instrumentation platform and it says, oh, here's some prescriptive ideas. You can go to Emerging Threat, you can go to Palo, you can go to all these different sites to download stuff. So we're pivoting out of the instrumentation solution. We're going to Emerging Threats, which probably a number of you are familiar with. And it says, hey, if you'd like to detect Angular, here's a signature you can add in. So I'm going to do this really, really cool hacker trick right here. I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to use this other hacker trick called SSH and just snort. I'm going to paste it. And that's as fancy as it got. So my instrumentation solution said, hey, you didn't catch this. Here's a signature to use if you want to catch it. Go ahead and add it. And let's try it again. That's it. This is just snort restarting, adding, it to, adding the rules to memory. Nothing really fancy there. So now that I've added it to snort, I want to validate that what I did actually worked. So I'm going to click on this button up here that says run again. What that's going to do is it's going to run it again. And when we run it again, hopefully, we get better results. Now, we didn't change anything from a preventative perspective. I didn't try to block the angler. So we see it's still not blocked, but boom, the event came up. And sure enough, we see that now it was detected by Snort, tied into my security onion, and reported to Splunk as an actual event. And that's pretty cool. And now we can take it to the next level. We can do it so there's actually a notable event coming out of Splunk. So that's pretty cool stuff. When we run these tests in an organization, some of the statistics that we see I think are pretty interesting. 75% of all attacks that are run between actors are not prevented. I don't care if you have 80 people in your security team or it's just you. This is just the way it is because people haven't had a way to validate that their tools are working the way they want. And that's a crappy number. Right? Who wants to drive a car that only works 25% of the time? Less than 40% of the attacks that are blocked actually have an event that shows up in your SIM. So out of that 25%, you only know less than half of them actually even happened. Right? And this isn't the extreme case. This is the average case that we see. I don't care if you're a big government organization, if you're a, a startup. This is, this is what we see. Okay. Is everybody here familiar with SIM technology, log management? And you're probably, a lot of you with Splunk as well. Splunk is a, a SIM that I'm uh, fond of as well. I think it's a great one. Also highly configurable, a lot of complexity there. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something very similar to what we just did with Snort. But I'm just going to do it with Splunk. And it's all about is Splunk correlating my rule. So this one, I'm going to use VOTRAC. If you recall from our first example, we used VOTRAC as part of a large sequence. I'm just going to use the single VOTRAC attack, though. Not Bartlex and no data exfil. And exact same thing. I'm going to execute a VOTRAC attack between a couple actors. I'm going to see if anything makes it into Splunk. OK. So we run this. goes through this process you've seen before. It's not blocked, but we see it's created a couple events now. So let's drill down into these events and let's see exactly what, what our sim told us. So remember, this was a VOTRAC attack. And we see all the raw data that came across to us from Splunk, and that's pretty cool. We can dive into that. But if we look at the metadata, emerging thread info, we have some packed executable. Here we have terse alphanumeric executable downloader, high likelihood of being hostile. Nobody knows what that means. It says everything in the world but VOTRAC. The person who wrote that log doesn't know what that means. So you're you're kind of at a disadvantage as a security person. How do, I, how do I actually write a SIM rule that's effective? So now let's go ahead and pivot to Splunk. This is Splunk Enterprise Security, so Splunk ES. So now we're in Splunk. We're going to create a name, a description. But this is the real cool part right here. We're going to paste the information we got from the instrumentation platform that says this. When you execute VOTRAC in your network, this is what it looks like based on your systems, your configurations, and your tie-in to Splunk. It won't look like that on your network, your network, your network, or your network. Just the network it was tested. This is why when I was at ArcSight, we could never share rules amongst customers because attacks are always different on everyone's network. This is why you have to test it on your protection network with a real attack and see how your systems respond. So anyways, we ran the attack with VOTRAC. It wasn't blocked. 
Veritin, the, the SIP solution that we're using here says, hey, by the way, this is what you want to use. We added it in, we ran it again, and now we said, look, it came out as a correlated event, or as Splunk calls it, a notable event. Pretty cool stuff. And I can tell you, that one little use case, I just want to write a rule in my SIM and validate that that rule that I just wrote worked. That's one of the biggest use cases in the world for SIM configuration. I wish I would have had this in my days at ArcSight, then my POCs wouldn't have taken three quarters to do. They're always a pain. And I don't care if you're using Elastic, if you're using Splunk, QRadar, Alien Vault, whatever. Sims are really, really hard to get right. And they're very expensive. And they take a lot of time and resources. And at the end of the day, you have no idea if they're even working, which isn't a great model. The first stat I had showed you was all about prevention. This stat's about detection and response. So as we all know, detection and response is much, much more expensive, much, much more manually focused, right? But if we start looking at this from, OK, we figured out we're only blocking 25% of our stuff. We're going to focus a little bit here. Of the attack patterns that are not blocked, less than half of them had alerts in the SIM. So not only was it even blocked, it wasn't stopped at all, but less than half of them even have an event. They're not even being detected. Right? So again, it's not just tuning your preventative controls, it's tuning your incident detection controls. Now let's pivot from network. Good instrumentation solutions should work across network and endpoint and email and cloud and be able to validate all those different controls. So endpoint's a little bit different. Instead of deploying sensors in strategic locations, this is how you do it, and this is really cool. A good instrumentation solution shouldn't require you to put a bunch of code and agents and things like that in all your desktops and servers. And again, that's 20-year-old thinking. You know, let's think differently. What we say is go ahead and take a version of what you're running in production, either a server or a desktop. You might have five or six different iterations, whatever. I don't care what your application is. I don't care that you're running some custom tool, that you're running Exchange, that you're running Active Directory, that you're running Oracle or Apache. None of that's relevant. All I care about from this perspective is, hey, Brian, I'm running Windows 7 with Silence. I'm running Windows 10 with McAfee. I'm running Linux with that. I'm running Mac with that, whatever. And I want to go ahead and stick that on a non-production system, could be a VM, whatever, and throw an actor on top. And then I want to ex execute a bunch of endpoint attacks. Can I steal credentials? Can I shut off the local firewall? Can I edit the host file? Can I rename services? Can I exfil data? I want to test non-destructive attacks, things that aren't horrible, but are certainly bad. On the other side, I also want to be able to test destructive attacks. Can I install a sandbox first? In our world, we call it protected theater, but whatever, it's a sandbox. On top of that, then you install the OS, then you install the uh, security control, the endpoint, and then you install the actor. The reason you do that is now if you execute malware and then semantic doesn't block it, you want to burn down that image and bring back the last known good image. Typical sandboxing approach with the caveat is we're not doing it for forensic analysis. We're using it simply to say, we ran 10 pieces of malware, your endpoint security control only blocked nine of them. Let's help you tune it so you can block all 10. That's it. And the reason we do the sandbox is we don't want the malware getting out. We're controlling all the network input outputs so it doesn't do any beaconing, C2, blah, blah, blah. Right? So let's look at that. Oh, one more non-offensive joke to give your brain a joke. Uh, let's see if I can tell this one. So I got this one off of Reddit this morning. So there's these three sailors, and they're on a life raft or something. And they've got three cigarettes, but they don't have any matches. So one sailor gets a great idea and throws a cigarette off the boat. And the guys are like, why'd you do that? How does that make any sense? Because I just made our entire boat a cigarette lighter. <laughs> right? Well, that crushed when I read it at 3 in the morning on Reddit. So. <laughs> so let's look at, is everybody here familiar with PowerShell? Or Shell? It's good, good. All right, so I'm not going to go too much background. If you want to get more on PowerShell, you certainly can, can research it. But I'm going to run some PowerShell attacks. Um, I, I like PowerShell for a couple of things. I think one of the best ways to use PowerShell against Windows is to steal credentials. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do something pretty cool. So a good security instrumentation solution should allow you to write your own attacks in whatever shell, including PowerShell. You can use Corn Shell if you want to, whatever you want to do. But let's say we want to go ahead and write something that will go ahead and escalate our privileges. We want to get system level privileges. So here, it's, boy, it's really hard to see that on there, I know. But there's an actual PowerShell attack that's in there. As you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It doesn't take a, a ton of code to do, to do the PowerShell attacks. But I'm going to break it into two pieces. One, I'm going to show PowerShell running. And then to say, let me just check what 
what user privileges I'm at right now on this endpoint system. Then I'm going to run my attack and see, okay, what user privileges do I have now? So basically, I'm going to run who am I, run a PowerShell attack, and then do the same exact thing and see what the result is. So the way you execute endpoint attacks on instrumentation solutions should be very, very similar to the way you do it on network, email, cloud, etc. So in this example, I'm pulling up one of the PowerShell attacks, and we can see, you might not be able to see, but it says who am I on the top, and it says PowerShell on the bottom. Okay. So let's go ahead and run this. We're going to run it just like you saw before. Again, nothing's really different when you're doing it on, on endpoint, which should be exactly the way it's done. Now, this is really cool because when we run this PowerShell attack, this is the type of thing when you're doing a pen test or any type of a security assessment. Um, it really helps augment to, you know, when you're showing people the results. So we ran PowerShell, and the first one runs, who am I? And it says, okay, you're John Doe. So it's not really an attack. It's just trying to level set things. Right now, our privileges are John Doe. Okay. Well, that's what we expected. It wasn't stopped, didn't create an event. There's nothing malicious about running Who Am I? But the second portion of the attack actually executed the PowerShell script that we just put in there. And when we ran that and we look at it, it actually says workgroup slash system. So the PowerShell was actually able to escalate our privilege levels. Our endpoint security product did not stop it. It actually did create some events, but it didn't stop the attack. And we see that a lot with endpoint. A lot of endpoint security controls will be like, hey, you're getting hit by something super bad, just FYI. <laughs> Not because it's a bad tool even. It also all comes out to configuration. You know, when people buy security products, they buy it for two main reasons. One, how good is the default configuration? And two, how much do I like the SC that sold it to me? That's it. And that's not a bad reason, really. But default configurations aren't necessarily going to be the best configuration for you. And we see that with firewalls and other tools as well. This one's really, really cool. Everybody here knows Mimi Cats? Mimi Cats is bad stuff, often tied to getting you know, golden tickets and things like that when you have to burn your servers down and drill holes in the hard drive. Um, Mimi Cats can be used for a number of things. One of the things it's really good at is stealing credentials. So let's look at an example where we're going to run Mimi Cats now. Um, just like we did before with the PowerShell attack, we're going to run it against some endpoints, but now I'm going to run it against a bunch of endpoints. And what I've chosen here in my lab when I set this up is I've got Microsoft Defender. I've got Symantec. I've got Malwarebytes. Does anybody here run Malwarebytes? Okay, this one's going to sting a little bit. Um, <laughs> and I've got Silence, right? And, and I, I say that in jest because I actually I know a lot of the guys at Malwarebytes. It's not a bad it's not a bad endpoint. This all has to do with how these tools happen to be configured in my lab. And some of them were purposely not configured optimally, or else it would be a pretty boring presentation. So. I'm basically selecting all the systems. Oh, and I have a test case too, where I have everything turned off. So it's, a, it's all Windows, it's all Windows 7 and some Windows 10. But it's a test case, so nothing's turned on, not even Microsoft Defender. Okay? So we'll kind of see how these different things operate. So I basically select, okay, I want to run it against these five systems. Remember, these are non-production systems, running all these controls, probably on a VM, right? And each one has an actor. I execute it just like we did before. So endpoints run really fast. So let's look at this first one. We ran MimiCats against Microsoft Defender. Right off the bat, Microsoft Defender stops MimiCats, and we can see the raw data, and it logs it. Now, it didn't log it to our SIM, but that's okay, because maybe in our lab environment we didn't have that set up. It logged the local stuff to Windows, right, Windows Events. So at least it said, hey, I see MimiCats, it's bad, and I'm going to tell you about it. So Microsoft Defender actually did a really, really great job as it comes to this. Now we're running it with Microsoft, oh, and here's the command line log, by the way. So when these execute, it will tell you what happened. This one's really, really boring. It said, hey, you tried to run something? And I said, no. That's what you want to see. You want to see something really, really boring. We don't want exciting things to pop up in this command line log. Well, now I'm running Mimi Cats against a Windows 7 machine running no security at all. So as expected, Mimi Cats was not blocked. And as expected, Mimi Cats did not create an event. But let's look at the command line log. If you've run Mimi Cats before, you recognize the little Kiwi up on top. So Mimi Katz is now iterating through all everything. It's enumerating through all the, all the credentials here. And we're looking at NTLM and SHA-1 hashes. And it will continue to run and operate and go through enti the entirety of the system until Mimi Katz says bye and exits the machine. So all we've proven at this point is it's better to run Microsoft Defender than run <coughs> nothing at all in this case. Okay? So Mimi Katz exited successfully. Okay. Now we go to Malwarebytes. Malwarebytes was exactly as successful in this case as running nothing at all. It didn't detect Mimi Cats, and it didn't uh, report on it. 
Now we have silence. Silence did not block it. And we can see the whole little Mimi Cats comes up and runs. But silence came up and said, hey, I just want to let you know Mimi Cats is running. It's really bad. <laughs> um, and But silence did log it to Splunk, at least, and it told Splunk about it. But Splunk actually didn't correlate an event on it, so you probably wouldn't see it anyways. That's that whole instrumentation cycle. Now, Malwarebytes and Silence absolutely positively can block Mimikatz. They just have to be configured to do so, and oftentimes out of the box, they are not. And then we look at the last case here is Semantic. Semantic, interesting, it blocks it, and they tell me it's because it happened so quick. It blocks it, but it doesn't log it. So I ask Semantic, oh yeah, we're just so fast, we don't log it. That's bullshit, but anyways. <laughs> um, but whatever. So, but Semantic did block it, which I guess if I have to pick between the two, I'd pick block. But um, it didn't log it. And again, it's not to say one's better than the other, right? At all, at all. This is simply to say, don't think of this as a security assessment or pen test against these systems. Think of this as a way to evaluate where the gap is to help you instrument and tune to get it where you need to be, right? You're not going to th throw out Splunk because it didn't create a notable event. You want to tune it and get it to the point where it can. That's why it bridges that whole red team, blue team gap, that whole purple team idea, right? We're all BFFs. Um, this one breaks my heart, again, after years and years of being at a sim company. Zero to 45%, and 45 is being really nice, actually. Zero to 45% of correlation rules actually ever fire when we're at a customer site. Zero to 45. That's awful. Zero is happening sometimes when you're spending all this money on sim. And again, most of you raised your hand for sim. DLP was number two. These are hard devices to get right in terms of validation. You can do all the right things, have all the smartest people. But one little change was made in your network that you had no control over, or something was changed on a firewall or a tap or whatever, and it makes this thing stop working. We've been in situations where people have rules written in their SIM predicated on IPSs that they don't even have in their environment anymore. So they're not even going to see the information. And that happens a lot. Remember that bank I mentioned with 350 different security vendors? I guarantee you their SIM's a nightmare. Another fun fact. This is a palindrome. So Taco Cat and Race Car are actually palindromes. Right? That's pretty cool. Atlanta is not, even though my nephew, who's uh, 25 years old, and I call him Mr. Baby, thinks Atlanta is, but it's not, and he's a moron. <laughs> so last demo I'll show you. And I, I like to hold this one to the end because this is, you know, we're all in security, and sometimes security doesn't have as lot of a voice as we want with the executive team. It's because we're not always speaking the language they want. And then sometimes you're invited to go present, and you get really excited, and you have a PowerPoint with 100 pages and all these technical bits and bytes, and then they never invite you back because you scared them. <laughs> right? So if you have a way to speak their language in a very simple, very clean way that talks about business risk without getting into the details, we find it to be very, very effective, and, and you actually become this hero. So everything we've done thus far that I've been showing you has been all these ad hoc tests. Test this, test that. The boss says, are we secure from that? And I want to validate. But the real power of an instrumentation tool is the fact that where you get things where you want it, I want it to all happen automatically and continuously every day or twice a week or whatever and do this validation because it's very low load on your network. It's not even really detectable. Each, each attack is only a couple packets. But think of it this way. I've got a bunch of stuff that's green. If anything turns red, if attack is allowed, if IPS isn't detecting, if a SIM isn't correlating, then let me know because now something's changed from a known good state to a bad state. And then further, in addition to being able to do that, we asked people, hey, do you want three-dimensional spinning globes and laser beams and all this stuff? And they said, no. We want a heat map that an executive, non-technical, non-security person understands. They understand red is bad. They understand that green is good. And they understand other colors in between is probably something in between. And if they look at something, they want to say, hey, Brian, I see a bunch of red stuff here. Can you tell me about that? And then I want to be able to drill into it and say, yeah, this is our critical server network. It looks like we have some issues here. Let's, let's drill down and see what's wrong. And by the way, these colors for a, a good instrumentation platform should be configurable. But now if I drill into one of these, I see that, oh, this is my critical server network, but I've got a whole bunch of clear text protocols opened up. I've got FTP, Telnet, um, I've got DNS, TFTP, uh, POP, and all these other things. I'm like, okay, that's a problem. And I also see anonymous FTP is allowed. I'm seeing that the actors can go ahead and do PII data exfiltration, and they can also do exfiltration of credit card data. So now I can go to them and say, hey, we got a problem where we're leaking data, and customer data, and credit card data. 
I need a way to block this. So I get on the phone with Bob, the infrastructure guy. I say, hey, Bob, why are all these clear text protocols opened up? This is supposed to be all encrypted. He goes, oh, I was doing some testing on the network. I forgot to shut them off. I know that never happens in any of your environments, but it happens to other people. So you say, please just turn on port 22. Show everything else off. So he goes, done. All set. We're, we're good to go. So we say run again, which as you all know, runs the test again. And when we run that test again, what we find out is port 22 is in fact open now, but he forgot to shut off port 69, TFTP. So now we're in a situation where we got to get back on the phone with Bob. Bob, what happened? Oh, sorry, fat fingered it. Forgot to put a hash sign in front of that. Go ahead. We're, we're good to go now. So now we don't trust Bob at all. So now we're going to create the, <laughs> the Bob continuous monitoring rule. So every day, forever, we're going to go ahead and validate that the only communication paths between the critical server network and other networks is SSH. And should it ever happen to add port 2021 or port 23 for Telnet or whatever it is, let me know so I can get back on the phone with Bob. Now multiply that times 1,000 or thousands of continuous monitoring checks, and now you're doing real instrumentation. And now you're communicating to your bosses effectively. And now you're showing them reports about what's working, what's not. And now you're explaining to them in terms they understand why you need $2 million in budget to hire people and invest in technology. You're speaking their language. You're speaking about business risk. And you're measuring it just like they measure ops and sales. So extremely powerful capability. This is uh, the last stat I wanted to share with you. This, uh, this is an interesting one. This company had 80 people on their security team. They ran 765 attacks on their production network. About 500 came from our tool, came from Veridin. Um, they had Anomaly as their threat intelligence feed, so they used some of that. They went to malware traffic analysis, and they dumped a whole bunch of PCAPs. And they had some folks that were pretty bright. They wrote some stuff in Python, I think one or two things in Ruby. So a good combo of us and them, kind of. Anyway, 765 attacks in total. 67% of the attacks were not blocked. Okay? 80 people on their security team, 67 weren't blocked. More than half the attacks weren't logged to QRadar, and it turned out they were actually blocking syslog on a lot of their systems that they didn't think they were. It wasn't even getting into QRadar, which was a problem because security only used QRadar. Splunk was used by IT ops, which was only 19% effective. Then we broke it up by product. We said, oh, and by the way, I think these are all good products. I'm not saying anything bad about WebSense, Palace, or Fire, FireEye. But take a look at FireEye. And by the way, this was when WannaCry was happening, so everybody was really concerned about ransomware. 100% of the attacks were allowed for FireEye. 100% of the ransomware was allowed for FireEye. They spent $14.4 million on their FireEye implementation four months before we got there. $14.4 million. Does anybody here work with FireEye? It's a great product. You've got to configure it correctly. These guys configured it with a very simple error. FireEye needs to look at bidirectional traffic. If FireEye sees unidirectional traffic because you messed up your tap or span port, it says, I'm going to drop this. I have no idea what the session is. In this case, it was completely useless. It could have just as easily been a hairdryer. 80 people in this room. The CISO and the CSO, they had both, kind of had a palm to head moment. They're like, how can I legitimize spending a single penny on another product or another person if the stuff that we've got isn't even doing anything? So he turned over, he goes, well, at least SourceFire is doing a little bit. It saw 41 of the attacks and it blocked a bunch of stuff. And the one person in the room that was responsible for SourceFire raised their hand and said, well, that's not exactly correct. We've actually thought about moving SourceFire into preventative mode. And we've actually altered the logs so they report prevention because we're in the process of pushing things over. But we haven't actually done that yet. So they were creating fake logs. Right? So this is not the extreme again. And it's not to go in there and say, you guys are stupid, your baby's ugly. Well, the baby is ugly. But, <laughs> or you have bad products. It was simply saying to say, guys, you've got complex solutions. You've got a lot of smart people. And they're doing a lot of great things. But they've never had a way to validate that the, what they're doing is actually working. And a pen test, an assessment, an audit's not going to do that. Furthermore, there was no way to look for environmental drift over time. So with that, let me go ahead and open up to questions as we have a few minutes and see if you guys have any, uh, any questions for me. Yes, sir? So it looks really cool being able to test out your stuff, turn things on, keep your tools a lot more tuned. Uh, the big problem I have is every time it turns it on, we tend to false positives and start blocking actual business. Yep. So how do you deal with false positives with this? Yeah. So the nice thing about this is the attacks that you run are the actual honest-to-goodness attacks. They're not some kind of virtual th thing. So if you run like an Angular, a Vodtrack, a Bartlex, that's what it really is. So if you go ahead and implement what the, what the tool says to leverage, 
you should only be blocking those types of attacks because it's predicated in the actual process. And that's a well-known problem, what you're going through. Every, every security person doesn't want to block any. They rather allow 10 bad things than stop one good thing. That's often the way people approach problems. This, you don't have to worry about that. You're actually blocking the real stuff with this. Great question, though. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, there are some open source things. Um, there's uh, Attack from MITRE, so check out some of the stuff MITRE's doing. It's a little bit more myopic in that it's focusing on just, a, I, I think there's like 50 different attacks that you're able to run for some pretty specific things. But I think it's a good way to start kind of, um, I don't know, making, making people aware of what a tool like this could do before you go into some type of commercial solution like us or some other, some other instrumentation solution. This is a very, very new field. Um, so my company, Veridin, we've only been around since 2013, but we've only been shipping products since 2016. So this isn't something that's been out there forever, like Endpoint or anything. So it's a concept that most people haven't heard of before. So uh, take a look at what MITRE does. I think you'll find some cool stuff there. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah, we absolutely do. And we've... I, I didn't have time to go into this, but there's tagging capabilities in this for CVEs, the attack framework. Um, we do stuff for GDPR and other types of things as well. NIST 853, NIST 892, so it can be tied to that. And then a lot of people take that on the back end, you stick some taxi to push things out as well. So it's, it's what we call it as our open, so the way we do it, I don't really want to pitch us, but we have an open content platform, which means we want you to be able to take in any type of attack and use any type of attack framework that you'd like to use in it. And it's very easy to use. You don't need to code or anything. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.